So welcome to our uh, Siebel Loop development discussion, uh, not development discussion, design presentation, my apologies. My name is Kelly Sinier. I'm the Director of Asset Management with the Greater Albuquerque Housing Partnership. And I just wanna go over a few housekeeping tips for you today. Uh, first of all, as you just heard, this meeting is being recorded. A version of it will be available on the GAPS YouTube channel and our Facebook page within a week after this meeting is um, completed. So you can use that for future reference if you have neighbors that you'd like to share that with. Uh, if you will find the Q&A button in, um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, that's where you can enter uh, questions for the panelists. Uh, and then we will have a, an opportunity at the end um, after the design presentation to address those. And additionally, I will be putting a link in the chat for everybody in case your comments don't get, uh, we don't, we run out of time or anything like that. We do want to hear your feedback and we do have a survey. Some of you may have already completed it, but I'll share that link in the chat again, just in case you want to share that as well. So with that, I will turn this over to our executive director with GAP, and that is Felipe Rayal. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. The Greater Albuquerque Housing Partnership was established in 1993 uh, to help address housing issues throughout our city. And we are established by the city of Albuquerque uh, but we are currently a, a separate nonprofit. Throughout our history, we've developed close to a thousand homes for first time home buyers and apartment dwellers. In the past 10 years alone, we have developed 582 homes for residents here in Albuquerque. All of our work is done here within the city limits, and all of our employees. Um, are based here in Albuquerque. So I'd just like to uh, share a little bit about why we're coming to you tonight. Uh, you can learn more about us at our website at abqgap.org. But we are coming uh, to you tonight because we are responding to a city request for proposal specifically for senior apartments on this site in the 10,000 block of Cibola Loop. We are calling our uh, uh, proposal to the city's RFP, Unity Park Living. And what we're looking to do is to, to build in on that, if you're looking at a, at a clock at, at this point, we're looking kind of come from like the, the six to nine o'clock hours where we would be developing a series of, of one-story buildings along Cibola Loop. And as the hill kind of goes down, uh, developing some two-story buildings and then a three-story building in the middle. We are designing this for seniors, 55 plus, but that set aside uh, will also allow multi-generational living. And what we mean by that is that at least one of the residents is 55 plus um, but there can be residents that are not 55 yet. Uh, this could include um, dependent children. Um, it also could include a, a spouse or a roommate or other living arrangements. So once again, this is responding to the city of Albuquerque, Department of Family and Community Services, request for proposals and this is our, our project. And I'll let the, the team talk a little bit more about it and I'll stand for questions as we go. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jackie Fishman with Consensus Planning. Wait, um, Felipe, were you yes. going to, I, I apologize for the presentation mode. Ah. My, my double screens are, are messing up on me right now, so. But did you sure. want to mention this first? Yes, before we go to Jackie, thank you, Kelly. Um, we'd invite you to come in and see any of our properties. You can feel free to give us a call, but we're also gonna host a special open house 
on a Saturday morning at 9 to 10 on Plaza Ciudadana. So this can be um, located just, um, just south of the, the freeway, almost at the Big Eye on the corner of Indian School and Broadway. Uh, that's a, a very similar, it'll have a very similar feel uh, with three stories uh, stepping down on the, on the edges along with an interior uh, parkway, or excuse me, parking lot and, and tenant amenities. And so we welcome you there in that morning, though, if you want to see any of the other properties, feel free to give us a call. Our, our number and, and information can be found once again on our website at abqgap, abqgahp.org. And with that, now I'll turn it over to Jackie Fishman with Consensus Planning. <clears throat> Thank you, Felipe, and, and good evening to everybody who's on the call. My name is Jackie Fishman. Uh, I'm a principal with Consensus Planning. Uh, our office is in downtown Albuquerque, and I'm on the team, I believe, because uh, you know we, we provide uh, planning services uh, on projects like this. Um, so I wanted to, to first explain uh, a little bit of the background of how the city got to, to where it's at with Cibola Loop. Um, my firm was hired in, I believe it was 2015 uh, by the uh, Department of Senior Affairs, the city's department to do a feasibility study. And that feasibility study involved uh, determining the best site on the west side for a new multi-generational center. Uh, it was a year long study um, and the recommended site after we did a you know, phone survey, we did demographic analysis, site analysis, site location criteria, but the site that scored the best uh, was Cibola Loop. And so uh, our feasibility report uh, recommended that the city uh, repurchase Cibola Loop. At one time, the city did own the property, but they sold it to a private developer. But we recommended that they repurchase it, not only for the multi-gen center, but also um, for a new library site and a new swimming pool. So those, those three city facilities were going to be on the property. It's about 26 acres in, in total. And of, of uh, that site, uh, five acres was set aside for uh, multifamily for seniors. And then another five acres was set aside for commercial development, like neighborhood commercial development. So uh, what we have tonight that Felipe talked about was the, the five acre site that um, uh, actually I back up uh, after the feasibility studies recommendation was accepted by the city council. Then uh, we were hired, my firm was hired to do what's called a site plan for subdivision and it subdivided the property and that's what created the five acre site. Uh, that the, this new multifamily uh, project would go on. The graphic that's shown on the computer right now is uh, it's the rendering that uh, starting from the left going to the right. Uh, the far left is uh, what would be the future library. The building in the center would be the multi-gen center. And then uh, the building to the right would be uh, the swimming pool. These are uh, you know, long-term projects. Um, so far, nothing has, has really happened there, but there's been a lot of talk about it uh, at, at City Council. So again, uh, going back to where we are today, um, we are looking at the five acres that would be off to the right of, of this graphic. Uh, and I think at this point, I will turn it over to Hannah to talk about the design concept. All right, well, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, uh, as Jackie mentioned, my name's Hannah. Um, Hannah Greenhood, I'm a principal at Dr. Peric Sabatini, um, uh, architecture firm assisting Greater Albuquerque Housing Partnership with the response to this RFP. It's a fantastic site with lots of great potential. And so what I'd like to do today is just walk through our initial concepts 
that um, is part of our process, very early preliminary design, um, schematic design process, just trying to um, figure out exactly what fits best for, for the project, answers to some community requirements in the surrounding neighborhood, and um, also meets the, the mission and the goals of both the city and the Greater Albuquerque Housing Partnership. So what's up on your screen right now is um, a site concept for what is being called Unity Park Living. Um, as Jackie mentioned, the uh, multi-generation center, the proposed library and the pool are all shown on the left part of the site plan. Um, and that quadrant of the Cibola Loop area that, that we've been studying, that five acre site um, is shown right where the cursor is. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and so, um, as Felipe mentioned, we're looking at a breakdown of different building types to provide a variety to hit some um, unique goals um, to not only to not only support seniors, but also to support uh, seniors with children. Um, and so thinking about those concepts, thinking about what a, an aging population might need, along with um, those who um, happen to be 55 plus, perhaps caring for children, we have a mix of both um, necessities for seniors and that aging population and potentially children. And so on the site, um, this greater site, we've made a few gestures to the larger master plan that's being proposed. We'd like to be an enhancement to what's there. Um, the first one is along the south edge connecting to the future development. Um, and Kelly, if you could go back up once, once more, thank you. Um, and then um, a little bit, a little bit further um, up north, there's a vehicular connection to that would then um, allow for some more connectivity from Cibola Loop itself, and then into the development. This really sets up the entire scheme for for the project. Um, in consideration of, of neighborhoods surrounding building heights and just trying to give a more residential feel, we've lined the, the Cibola Loop edge with some smaller scale, less dense projects um, with the, um, a, a larger L-shaped building towards the center. This allows for some stepping along that neighborhood edge. Um, and again, that variety necessities that um, this type of demographic really needs. There's different, different people at this age that have different requirements depending on um, what they might be doing in their day-to-day -day life. And so um, to further explain that density, if you'll go to the next slide, Kelly, um, this is a, a very preliminary view of some massing um, along Cibola Loop. Uh, this street view is um, looking to the north. So you see on the left side, some lower scaled one story and two story um, casitas along that perimeter. And then Kelly, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, this is the view from the north looking south down Cibola Loop. So you can see that scale as it builds up from that, that edge of the property up to a three story L-shaped building uh, with apartments um, within those as well. The smaller scale buildings are, are more townhouse-like. And the next one, please. This graphic shows um, a bird's eye view of what that, that scale looks like relative to the existing neighbors. Um, just adjacent to us, you'll notice that there's um, two-story and three-story multifamily. And so Keeping me in nature with that, um, the three buildings that are just to the north of on our site are single story, and the two at the southern edge um, go up to two story. Each of those little casitas have um, have four units, so they're they're quads, and they serve the need to help um, support grand families. So these are larger units. Um, the three, the two, the two buildings to the south um, have three bedrooms, and the ones to the north have two bedrooms. So it gives again that variety. So the next view on the next slide shows um, another perspective where now you can see some of the 
um, support stations that are just south, to, south of the site. And diving into the site plan a little bit deeper, a blown up view getting into some of the site amenities and the character of, of the site design itself. You then can, you can again see those casitas lining the perimeter of Cibola Loop and, um, and that L-shaped building um, tucked into the corner of the site. Um, very specifically, there's a couple site amenities that will be provided. Um, a dog park at the center, outdoor gathering spaces for, uh, with shade structures um, at the southern edge of the L-shaped building. Uh, potential green space that wraps in and out of, um, of the interstitial space between the buildings. And uh, most importantly, uh, a looping path around the entire property, trying to promote wellness for all ages and, um, and the community at large, allowing people to get out and move their bodies, active, um, active engagement at all levels. There is a plan to have some um, protected parking in the center of the, of the parking lot and then some um, parking on the outside. Just to talk a little bit more about parking, um, we are uh, currently exceeding the requirement for parking. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, definitely in, a, in an aging population, there tends to be support for all different levels. So allowing additional parking for potential caregivers or support systems, extended family. Um, and so our base, our base parking count um, exceeds uh, pretty substantially what's required by the over, overlying zoning codes. There is also some space, you'll see that number 12 for pick up and drop off um, because uh, traditionally senior, senior populations tend to actually not need as many car support, but in order to really um, to plan ahead for all of the potential needs and, and visitors, there is a, a car drop off for um, everything from um, medical services down to Uber. So the next, the next image is showing um, some of the interstitial spaces. So in these grand family concepts, the site plan um, has opportunities uh, between what we're calling the fingers between the buildings to connect the entire site um, into different zones. And so throughout the site between these buildings, we've developed, are starting to develop play zones and respite zones. This diagram shows um, uh, potential locations for play zones. And then the next slide um, talks about respite zones. And this really speaks to the quality of life where um, those raising, raising children, um, whether you're a grandparent or, or otherwise, um, we, we definitely understand the need and balance for both play and rest. And so being able to have different variety of outdoor spaces drives these concepts between the fingers of these, of these interstitial um, spaces between these larger casita type buildings. And so with that, this last slide is again to um, circle back to an overall aerial view um, and talk a little bit about the three-story building. So the three-story building um, uh, definitely will be below the, the required height on the site. Uh, most likely will be someplace between 36 and 38 feet. Um, but again, tucked away from that edge to uh, protect uh, the quality of the area. Um, some of the amenities within the building that are being discussed are um, opportunities for teenagers, so a teen lounge, um, social services, um, places to gather, areas for potlucks, uh, fitness areas, and, a, um, and other opportunities for the community within, within the, the project to come together. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Thanks, we're gonna actually continue with Jackie. All right, okay. Uh, thank you, Hannah, that, that was great to, to hear your, your presentation. Um, so, uh, the next part of the presentation, um, I'm going to explain 
if we are so lucky to be chosen by Family and Community Services to do the project, um, the project approval process will include uh, going through the DRB or the Development Review Board. Uh, the, our existing zoning is RML, uh, residential, uh, it's like res RML is residential multifamily low. Um, and uh, the city's process, if you are, have uh, 50 units or above, uh, it requires uh, going through DRB for approval uh, for a site plan. And so that process will require um, a pre-application notice to uh, the affected or the recognized neighborhood associations in the area. Um, I, my office would send out the notice um, via email with the offer to have a public meeting um, facilitated. And then um, once that is complete, uh, we would move forward towards the submittal to the DRB. And once we make the submittal, uh, we would notify once again the affected neighborhood associations in the area uh, and also adjacent property owners within 100 feet uh, minus the public rights of way. Uh, we will send a, a, a letter through US uh, Postal Service uh, notifying people that we have made the application to the DRB. Uh, that uh, meeting will be a public meeting uh, before the DRB, uh, where uh, if, if someone, member of the public comes, they can make comments uh, at, at, during the meeting. Uh, it's a technical review uh, by, by city staff. I, I don't know if the participants on the call uh, this evening know very much about, about that process, but we've got uh, someone from planning uh, is, is the, actually the chair of, of the DRB is, is from the planning department. We have somebody from city park, someone from hydrology, um, someone from the Albuquerque Bernalillo County uh, Water Utility Authority. Um, and then who else am I missing? Um, I think that's it. Oh, and, and code enforcement. Can't forget code enforcement. So those are the city staff members that, that review applications. Um, and uh, again, we will be going through that process uh, once, once, we, um, once we get chosen for the project. Um, I, 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 I would say if there are any, any questions at this point, we're all happy to answer those. Uh, I think the slide is pointing to the Q&A uh, tab on, on Zoom. And so if anybody wants to ask us some questions, feel free to, to start. And you are more than welcome to use the Q&A or the chat option either way, and we'll make sure that we can address those. We have a question from Aaron asking how many total units? Um, I'll jump in and answer that question. Um, we're currently proposing approximately 130 units. There was also a question from Charlene on the percentage of federal dollars applied to the rent. I didn't quite know how to answer that question, so I'll, I'll kind of do it in two parts. Uh, the RFP for the city is for the five acre site and $3.6 million in federal home dollars, which are uh, uh, funds from the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development pass through the city's Department of Family and Community Services. Those home dollars are specifically for affordable housing development. And the $3.6 million is estimated to be about 20% of the total development costs. I also saw a second question from Charlene um, that 
uh, just that she did not like the the entrance. Um, we're, we're a little constrained with how we ingress and egress off of the property because once again, the housing site that we're proposing for, we're not the master plan developer for the entire site. We, if we are accepted or receive notification of the RFP, um, we can only kind of enter and access out, off of our site. So we've, we've done two as not to overload either of those entrances. Um, and so that's, that's one limitation of our site. Felipe, we have another question for you. Um, will, will they be low income housing and what will that do to our taxes and values of our home? Sure. Uh, so the, the, first, the first step is if we're kind of looking back is we're as a nonprofit developer here in Albuquerque, uh, we would be responding to the RFP. So the RFP has some requirements that um, specific requirements that a certain percentage of those units would be uh, set aside to low income persons. And so low income, I want to really qualify, does not mean no income. And so the, the weighted average of those incomes would probably be 60% of Albuquerque's area median income, which in 2020 was around 69,000. Uh, in 2021, uh, the, the forecast is around 67,000. So folks would have to make 60% of that. And then once again, it's adjusted on your, on your family size. So the folks that, that choose to call our apartments home can't make more than those limits, but they do also have to have a minimum income uh, to qualify. So if the rent is $650, for example, they would typically need to be earning close to $2,000 a month uh, to be able to qualify uh, to live in the apartment um, without being rent burdened. And that means more spending more than 30 to, to 50% of their income on rent. So there would be a band that those folks could uh, qualify for. They couldn't make excess of the area median income limits, uh, but they'd have to make at least um, a, a minimum level in order to, to pay the rent levels. Thanks, Felipe. Jackie, I think this is one that you can um, address. The neighbors are concerned about the traffic. You wanna explain that process? Um, sure. Uh, there was a traffic study done uh, for the, uh, when we did the site plan for subdivision. Uh, that was done, let's see, looks like uh, 2000, I'm looking at the signed off site plan. The, the traffic study was done in 2016 um, and uh, there was some improvements called for uh, by the traffic study. Uh, the, the, it was uh, created by Terry Brown who does about, I don't know, 95% of all traffic studies in the Metro. And um, that uh, traffic study was reviewed by city transportation and approved. Was there a, a more detail on the on the question? Or? No, I think that's that. Unless the um, any of our attendees have additional follow up on that, I think that answered it. Um, Felipe is, uh, I think, considering an answer. Um, we we had a question about why choose fifty five age as a senior. Um, you want to share that with the rest of the group, Felipe? Sure. Uh, so this funding source allows 55 plus uh, as, as a senior population. There are some specific uh, other federal programs that have higher or different uh, classifications for senior households, uh, but the home dollars, which are Department of Community Development within the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I know a lot of acronyms, uh, but they uh, they classify seniors as 55 plus. Cool. And we have a 
I think a follow up to the traffic question. What about the road? Will it be widened and will there be a bike lane? Um, I, I am looking up the traffic study as, as I speak. Um, so if you could give me a couple minutes, I will pull that up and, and be able to, to answer that question. I, I haven't looked at this study in, in a while. So um, if you, you want to, someone wants to, what, I'm sorry? Yeah, while you look that up, Jackie, I'll answer the second part of Angela's okay. question. Uh, what will this do to, the, to our taxes and values of our home? Um, so there's kind of a twofold question. There's, um, I, I guess the best answer I can give you, because I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I mean, if, if we come in and propose a multi-million dollar investment and increase property values, that could potentially increase taxes. Um, but some of the studies that we have seen and we can provide in the uh, some links and, and follow up is that on balance, well thought out affordable housing like this uh, tends to be neutral or slightly positive to home values. It does not uh, tend to decrease home values. Um, once again, at the edge here, we're not we're not abutting any specific single family edges, though in the greater Cibola Loop area, there are a couple of single family neighborhoods. Um, and so that would be the, the main, uh, the main, my main thoughts on, on taxes and, and values of our home. The, the other thought being is, is take a look at some of the redevelopment that, uh, that has occurred around uh, some of our properties, uh, specifically our Quattro property on, on 4th Street. Uh, we were one of the first uh, to kind of re, redevelop along 4th in the early to mid 2010s. After that, there's been a, a number of, of uh, breweries that have, have sprung up in that neighborhood because the zoning allows it, not, big, not because we proposed it as part of our design plan, but also a couple of, of, uh, of restaurant developments. Uh, including a new Monroe's and also uh, another uh, market rate uh, teetering on the luxury level came into that neighborhood after we uh, kind of reestablished it. And it was on the site of the, the first, uh, uh, I think it was a, a Gallus, uh, the first Gallus motor lot in Albuquerque. Okay, I, um... Felipe, I did pull up the recommendations from, from the traffic study. I'll try to summarize them. There's, there's a number of, of recommendations uh, regarding uh, the three driveways that we showed on the site plan for subdivision. Um, one is at Mill Road, uh, which would be a full access, unsignalized access driveway A via Ellison Drive would be right in, right out, left in only. And driveway B on Cibola Loop would be full access, unsignalized, one lane, uh, entering and one lane exiting. On Ellison Drive, um, the east uh, Cibola Loop um, calls for restriping the existing westbound right turn lane to become a shared uh, through right turn lane, uh, construct a third westbound through lane to the proposed driveway A. And I, I know you can't see uh, what, what these uh, access points are right now on the screen, um, but uh, then also the west uh, part of, of Cibola Loop extend the southbound left turn lane from 75 feet to 325 feet plus a, a transition area. Um, also at Ellison Drive and uh, Coors Bypass, extend the northbound left turn lane from 210 feet to 625 feet plus a transition. Um, and then lastly at Ellison Drive and Driveway A, 
uh, construct a, a westbound right turn diesel lane of 325 feet. There, there's a lot of engineering, you know, uh, terminology in here, but it, it basically um, looked at uh, the existing traffic at that time in 2016, 17, and uh, recommended all these different um, uh, extensions to uh, the turning movements, um, new uh, turn lanes, uh, restriping. So uh, again, this uh, there was always concern about uh, traffic in this area. Uh, and it was addressed in, in the traffic study. Does anyone have a, a follow-up question to that or? There's a concern, Jackie, and maybe you can address this to um, the study from 2016 or maybe Hannah, the Broadstone apartments were we're not there. You want to answer that one, Hannah? No, sorry. I was lifting my hand to um, someone walked by my desk. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ping it back to Jackie then maybe. Okay. Well, if it's Broadstone, then my office probably worked on that. Um, so I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm looking through the traffic study to see what their assumptions were. But um, if it, I think it, I think it was in the process, but I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't guarantee that. But if, if there are, if there is more development um, that has occurred since the traffic study was completed and approved, then as the other this, this project um, that uh, Greater Albuquerque Housing Partnership is doing would not trigger a new traffic study. It doesn't, doesn't warrant a new traffic study, but if the other uh, city uh, uh, buildings that we talked about, the library, the multi-gen center, and the pool, if, if it's determined to be warranted by city transportation, then the traffic study would probably be revisited and um, mostly with a, a trip generation analysis uh, to see if there's any appreciable uh, change in, in the amount of traffic that is in the area as compared to when the traffic study was done. Um, and I would say that generally speaking, uh, Terry Brown, who, who did this traffic study, uh, is fairly conservative in his assumptions. So, um, you know, we would have to dive in a little bit deeper into this, but, but again, uh, it, when he did it, he assumed a uh, full build out of the Siebel Loop site with multifamily there, the three city facilities and five acres of community or of, uh, I'm sorry, of neighborhood commercial use at the Siebel Loop 26 acre site. It looks like um, Angela also is asking about streetlights. And yes, I'm, I'm sure there, there will be streetlights as, as part of this development. Um, this, this project is only five acres out of the 26 acres. And so the burden of, of most of this build out is, is on the city of Albuquerque. And um, they, at the time when we talked about this, you know, five, six years ago, uh, they were looking at some sort of cost share um, uh, between the different departments because you're talking about uh, three different departments that would have buildings in this area, and that would be uh, cultural services, family, and uh, I'm sorry, cultural services, senior affairs, and then parks and recreation. So all three departments would have to pitch in to, um, you know, do some cost share of, of the roads that, that go into Cibola Loop, of the sidewalks, uh, of the utilities, the drainage, all of that.
then it looks like will there be a bike lane and shoulder um i if you're talking about a bike lane around um Cibola loop i'm not sure i can answer that off the top of my head but uh again um if you want to uh, give us your email address. I can try to find out a little more detail and get back with you about that. Okay, I think, um, thank you, Angelo. We will I'll copy that down. <clears throat> um, I think that that We've answered all of the questions in the chat as well as in the Q&A. So if there are no other questions, I'll give you guys just a second. Thank you guys for attending for sure. Um, I put a couple of links in the chat for you. One, the link to the survey as a reminder again. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to provide that feedback, and also the article that Felipe referenced in regards to um, low-income housing and impact on, on property values. So I'll give you a chance to copy and, and paste those outside of here so that you'll have them available to you. And I think we're, we're good. All right. I think I think that um, everybody's asked their questions, so we'll close this out. And I appreciate everyone's participation today. Have a great evening. <laughs>